Today is on um, osteoporosis, false prevention by Dr. Lydia Ao. And as you know, Home Nursing Foundation have been serving frail and vulnerable homebound patients for the past 46 years. We provide home health care services such as home medical, home nursing and home therapy services and home personal care as well. In the last couple of years, we have started to run two senior care centres, one in Haogang, one in Bangkok, and one active ageing centre in Bangkok as well to serve the needs of both dependent and well seniors in the community. And we aim to improve their function, their health and their overall well-being. Under the leadership of Dr. Ng, our medical advisor, we have the privilege of organizing a series of continuing professional education so that we can raise our capabilities and to better care for our patients holistically and empower them to live joyfully in the community. So we have just completed a series on end-of-life care for frail elders. We've also done a series on function and rehab and dementia as well. And these are available on the YouTube videos that is um, accessible on the QR code that you will see on the slides. So we also want to warmly welcome you to and invite you to attend our caregiver conference on 6th of October this year at Suntec Convention Center as we launch our care pathway on caregiver support in the community. So this afternoon, we are very privileged and looking forward to Dr. Lydia Ao. Um, head of Geriatrics at Ng Teng Fong, who will be sharing her knowledge with us on fall prevention and osteoporosis in the community. And I'll pass the time to Dr. Ng to introduce her. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Christina. Yeah, um, hi, hello. Uh, we're very honoured and um, privileged to have Lydia, Dr. Ao, to be with us today. She has been a leader in geriatric medicine for many years. I know her for many years as well. Also, I've seen many of her patients. They all loved her. She's a great doctor, and uh, but all, um, she has been um, very important in developing and setting up the geriatric practice in, in Jurong Health Campus and Ng Teng Fong Hospital in particular. And I'm sure uh, for those of the community doctors who did the Diploma in Geriatric Medicine, you know that she's the principal. She's the director of the Diploma in Geriatric Medicine program. And uh, her special interest is in osteoporosis, falls, and autogeriatric. So, um, I understand in the community, we do see many seniors, you know, coming back from hospital with lots of medications, calcium, vitamin D, um, alendronate, and sometimes uh, we are not sure when to start and what to monitor, and also when do we initiate and when do we do BMD and so on. But of course, um, she reminded me, false is really the more important crisis that we need to prevent. So maybe she's got lots of slides to share. Uh, we schedule one hour, but we may spill over. And if those of you who have something else to do, you may take leave. But uh, we, will, uh, we will have a, a lecture by Lydia. And after that, uh, I'll moderate for a Q&A session. So Lydia, please. Thank you, Wai Chong, for the introduction. I think everybody can see my screen. Um, it's a privilege, and uh, thank you very much, Christina and uh, Wai Chong, again, for um, in introducing me and inviting me to this. Actually, I kind of always hijack any kind of talk to talk about my favorite uh, uh, topic, which is actually more force and osteoporosis. I want to disclaim that I'm an osteoporosis expert, <laughs> but I think that force being something that is really close to my heart because uh, a lot of our, our patients that come in obviously fall in the community. So there's a lot more work to be done. And I'm taking today, as I keep saying, I always hijack things, um, to actually really talk about the few, the, the, what I call the F3s you know, and uh, 1 O. So the frailty, the falls, the fractures, okay, are the ones that actually you and I see a lot more. And obviously, the treatments uh, that usually would be started uh, by specialists in the hospitals or even in the polyclinics and then finally end up with you. So, um, you know, without further ado, um, I think Wai Chong has given you a heads up. I've got 80 over slides, but don't worry. Um, you know, I, I do talk very fast. I am trying to slow down. For all of you who know me, actually, I talk this way. It's going to be much faster than this. All right. So, first of all, um, let's, let's look at the... Okay. So I wanted to just remind everyone that, you know, uh, in medicine today, it's not about uh, organ disease anymore. It's really much more about what the patient is all about. And actually, uh, I, uh, in, in where I am now, our juniors, we actually focus on the four M's. 
what matters to the patient most? What what the, what has the disease uh, uh, done to them? What are the uh, medications that they actually have to eat? What are the uh, mobility issues they experience? And actually, uh, is there a mentation problem? So that are the four M's that we use as a practical way of assessing a patient quickly. So um, we are moving into a holistic approach and not just about the heart, the lung, the whatever, you know, organ disease. And let's start with the first or only case study I have. Let's talk about Auntie G. So Auntie G, uh, you might, most of us you know, might see them in the community. She comes in just for URTI, had a previous hip fracture. And actually, she has fallen three, uh, uh, three times in the last two years. All right. And although she was recommended to have a walking aid, uh, a, a point stick, she loves the walking, uh, walking with an umbrella. She said, convenient, ma. You know, I can use it when it rains. Then actually, uh, when she rains, uh, there's nothing that holds her up, you know, and, and she uses it as a walking stick, all right? But her children, who doesn't really stay with her, she actually likes to be independent and stays on her own. And actually, I've noticed that increasingly, a lot of our older persons are actually, in a way, staying on their own. They are kind of isolated. And this family thing about children staying with their uh, parents, okay, is not realistic anymore. And that includes myself, you know, my, I don't stay with my parents and they actually stay on their own. So her past medical history, she's diabetic, she has hyper, you know, the sun gao, huh? and she has obviously osteoarthritis, okay, and her medicines are, I, I'm, this is actually a, 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 a pretend list, right, if you see any older person with only four medications, you will start laughing, because like, really, man, it's not true, right, they have a lot more than us, okay, so this is her examination, I, obviously, it's not anti-G on your left, but, you know, this is, uh, uh, um, what I was telling Wai Cheong that, you know, uh, a picture does play a thousand words. I wanted to show you how a typical old person that comes through your door will start uh, uh, flagging out red flags, okay? So if you look at her, she will typically represent somebody that you really want to intervene for. So they, all the examinations are there. She's actually not too bad. Okay, and, uh, you know, when asked to walk, she has some difficulty rising from the chair and she really took a, a while to get, you know, uh, to the chair, in fact. Okay, so let's ask the first question, you know, can we identify the risk factors in this patient for falling? What are the examination points that should be included in those findings that you, that I scheme across? So maybe I just show you what, what was her physical finding. Not something spectacular. Nobody would be able to pick up anything further, actually. So I just want to be a little bit more, um, I guess, representative and realistic, you know, in the uh, outpatient setting. And you always say, ah, yeah, Lydia, I'll practice in the hospital all the time in the world, a hospital bed, very easy to do examination. But I had the privilege of working in NUP in the last three years. Uh, I follow the family physicians and we actually run a combined clinic. And I, of course, then know the constraints of even in the polyclinic, how hard it is to have a detailed examination of the older person there. All right. So, and, uh, you know, what are the examination points that should be included that we should look out for? I always tell my juniors, if you've only have five minutes of your life to examine this patient who is lying on the bed, what will you look out for? And we'll talk about those. Okay. So let's look at the answers really fast. Huh? I'm already one third way, like real. <laughs> Okay, so the first four factors, okay, we want to actually really ask, was there a history of recurrent falls? Um, you know, how sedentary was a lifestyle? Okay, these are the risk factors that, you know, uh, really flags up. Age, you know, any peripheral neuropathy, for instance, any visual acuity issues, okay? So I want to bring you to the first evidence base that I promised you all. Um, I felt that this was a very good reading, but of course, for all of you who are like me, you know, you read halfway, you fall asleep because I think there are 64 pages in this paper itself. Um, but it's actually good to at least look at the summaries. And uh, I felt that, uh, you know, uh, whatever they recommended is really no rocket science. But it's a matter of how do we then bring it to Singapore, so to speak, bring it to your clinic and then practice it religiously, right? So, I just want to go through quickly again. What is the WHO definition for fall? It's a person who is coming to rest inevitably, uh, inadvertently, meaning that if you decide to sit on the floor, then obviously uh, that is not a fall. Okay, and uh, you know, fall trips and slips, okay, uh, from a higher level to a lower level. And uh, for the WHO definition, it includes a Singapore uh, episode, all right? So what are the risk factors that actually, um, again, you know, you would, you and I would probably see in the community uh, in our older folks. 
uh, people who have got intrinsic problems with muscle weakness, balance uh, disorders, cognitive impairment, people who are depressed, visual de deficits, people who are quite old. So I know, and um, I, 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 it's my perception, but uh, I actually were um, so-called working in four polyclinics in the West. And I felt that the Bukit Batok host the oldest lot of patients. Next comes Chua Chu Kang, Pioneer and Jurong. Jurong has a bit older and Pioneer seems to be the youngest lot. Lah. So that, that was my perception across the West. All right. Uh, it's hard to measure postural hypotension in the clinic. But I guess if you have all that time in the world, in inverted commas, and that takes at least five minutes to do this uh, exercise. All right. Uh, then go for it. The extrinsic things that I felt that you and I can control a bit better really is going to be polypharmacy and psychotropic agents. The rest, uh, you can glance at it and you can then give advice. So let's go through some of this. Now, so this was the algorithm that actually was in that paper that I just uh, 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 highlighted to you all. I think the most important thing really is how do you assess for severity? And you would want to ask, was there uh, more than two falls last year? That already is straight away, you know, you're down, you know, as the, 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 the high fall risk person. Persons with frailty, people who are lying on the floor and unable to get up, all right, and loss of consciousness. So these people are considered higher fall risk, all right, and with high fall risk usually, uh, and they have fallen especially, there's definitely going to be a, a, a good look at secondary prevention and treatment, looking at a multifactorial force at risk assessment and you tailor those uh, interventions. To be honest, um, even at the polyclinic level, it's really very hard to actually do all these, but uh, we can always try, right? I thought that, you know, in the intermediate, it's called depending on time. But right at the other end, when the person is really fitting, uh, fighting fit, right? We have got 75, 85 that are walking, uh, that are coming through our door just for maybe vitamins or whatever it is that they want, but they're really very fit. So these people, you would still want to give a bit of education on how fall prevention can be done and encourage physical activities, all right? Because they, you don't want them to become sedentary. Now, if it's intermediate, then it's really, uh, 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 really up to you. I, I mean, you know, I feel that sometimes constraints with time, constraints with different types of patients that you see, but you know, by all means, try. I always say try. <laughs> Better try than don't try. Okay, so let's, let's uh, then look at what are the things that have, in my opinion, uh, quite a bit of uh, a bandwidth that you can do in the clinic setting or in the community setting. This paper was actually uh, uh, taken, uh, this table is taken actually from um, uh, the paper quoted below. Okay, it's actually uh, done... Uh, uh, printed in the Singapore Medical Journal and uh, you all can uh, pull it out uh, for reference. Okay, so the table is actually, two tables are from there. First, just look at the vision. Certainly, I keep stressing the medication review. I've said many, many times that Singapore is probably one of the last few, I guess, uh, countries that have primarily the physicians that give the prescription. Um, in some other countries, nurses can prescribe and we are already getting there and the pharmacists can prescribe. But, you know, for us, uh, before intent and purposes, we are still holding the license to kill. So psychotropic drugs, you know, and all types of other medicines that are actually quite detrimental and cause persons to fall, uh, you know, is actually in your category. Uh, we talk about postural hypotension. We talk about vitamin D supplementation. And I'll go a little bit more on that. And, you know, just general advice, you know, about how you can reduce the incidence of falls. Now, this one is a, a little bit more... Um, uh, if you are more capo, you know, so my middle name is capo uh, because as I said, I have got more luxury of time. Uh, I ask about their exercise. I ask about the home environment. And actually, you know, uh, everybody should look at uh, other people's shoes. Okay. I mean, people always think uh, something's wrong with Lydia Ao. I either look at their shoes, I look at their eyes, and then I look at their legs. So people think I'm a little bit weird. But I'll tell you, there's a reason for this. Okay. Actually, just to point out, right, this duck is clearer than a lot of other older people. Now, um, this checklist is actually easy to get. Uh, I actually got it from uh, LG Cal, but you it is actually easily easily available anywhere. I mean, meaning if you just Google it, print it down, and give it to your patients, it'll be actually useful. It's actually a checklist of how to make it elder safe in your uh, in your homes or in their homes. And I thought that you know, um, we cannot always say, oh, you know, I don't have those uh, resources. Actually, uh, thanks to COVID, right? Everything is now online. <laughs> so I find that you know, getting a lot of these resources is actually quite a 
In fact, I have got such a buffet of um, pictures, right? I took quite a bit of time to choose. Yeah. Anyway, so let's come back to my favorite pastime, which is drugs. Uh, okay. So all these ones, all these things do cause problems. Okay. Uh, and, and they are actually high risk or false. I want to point out one big category, the anticholinergic drugs. In the community, we do notice, and unfortunately, some of our ED colleagues as well, um, let me point out the favorite culprits that I keep picking up. Atrax, I hate it. Pyroton, all these are antihistamines. They have got a high anticholinergic load. In fact, the four M's that I mentioned about way uh, early in our talk, uh, the medication group that um, IHI is actually an IHI model, the Institute of Healthcare, don't know what, don't know what improvement, that's right. Uh, IHI model of four M's. The big group of medicines that they were actually targeting were actually anticholinergic drugs. So in our Singapore context, all the A's are uh, Atarex, uh, 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 Anorex, okay? These two are, are my most hated uh, uh, medicines uh, in the community. Then Periton, okay? Uh, so don't, don't come and say, oh, you know, Lydia Al says all the medicines cannot give, you know, cardiac medicines, and they have an, oh, don't give, then all will die. La. But <laughs> it's actually judicious use uh, review of whether they need to be cut down as they get older and definitely not to get into the anticholinergic properties, okay? I mean, don't get into those that have uh, high anticholinergic loads, all right? So, so any, me any medications uh, that is likely to affect balance, which actually, in my opinion, let's just go back onto the anticholinergics and a lot of the sedatives here. Now, we go to the second, uh, um, the second point or the second question I asked. What are the additional examination points? Okay, so you'll be like scratch your brain a little bit. Really, we talk about posture blood pressure. It's actually easy to do if we have got a technique to it. Any aortic murmur, I have unfortunately um, um, also missed recently and it was such a shy moment for me because this was obsessive compulsive on my behalf. Uh, or, 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 you know, I, I put that on myself for many, many years to listen to the aortic murmur. But recently, because auntie here was uh, getting old, I guess, I got STML. So I forgot to listen to this woman on the very last day that she was about to go home. Uh, luckily, my junior doctor who was taking her MRCP say, Dr. Ow! I've just heard something. I said, what, what? She said, oh my God, this lady's murmur is out of this world. I said, uh oh. So we actually had an air call uh, one hour before she got discharged and obviously the results were not out. And I told the son, I said, uh, if I have to have bad news, I will call you. And truly, okay, I had to call him. And actually what was in the history that we totally did not review was the fact that she came in for near Singapore uh, complaints. She said, I stood up, I almost blacked out, I just went down. But luckily, you know, somebody caught me. So it turned out that she had critical aortic stenosis and we had to rush her and give her all the advice uh, two days later to the uh, aortic um, uh, um, valve clinic, okay? And uh, the surgeon there was so nice. He arranged overnight and everything so that she can be reviewed uh, as soon as the office opens. So please, don't miss it like I did, okay? It's a very shy moment for me or embarrassing moment, not shy. We, we see a lot of strokes and Parkinson's uh, uh, that uh, should not be missed. And, uh, you know, I'm sure those people who run daycare centers and, and those people who run uh, exercise rehab uh, situations or, or, or uh, scenarios, right? You will see a lot of these patients and therefore, you know, that's the only the reason why they're there, right, sometimes. And obviously, things that we can always reverse, presence of a cataract. I thought that, you know, for uh, completeness sakes, for all of us who have forgotten how to do a postural blood pressure, I'm not going to uh, uh, dwell very much on it. It's actually for your self-reading. You might want to take a snapshot of this because I'm not going to read every single line. Then this, this lecture is going to go on until tonight. All right. Now, I wanted to highlight quickly that this is so vital because this is something that we easily can pick up in the community. Any person with visual acuity issues, the three biggest ones or the three biggest culprits in our older people are cataracts, AMDs, and glaucoma. Cataract is the single most surgically reversible eye situation that the older person has. Please don't miss it because, uh, you know, there's actually evidence uh, uh, that uh, if, you, if you have uh, uh, two eyes with cataracts sticking out not taking out the whole eye, uh, taking out one cataract, okay? The p-value is 0 0.001 for false risk reduction. So please look at the eye. 
I wanted to then move on to, uh, you know, uh, for all of us who are maybe in a less uh, fast-paced setting, what are the screening tools that you want to consider when you see an older person in the community? These are the ones that you can think about. Time up and go, suck F, nutritional screening tool. With, actually, auntie here also cannot remember what are the components. And the FRAC score. And I'll tell you why we're going to do some of this. I thought that, you no, know, uh, the time up and go uh, for practical application, if you press a ting tong and, you know, the patient haven't even reached your door after uh, two minutes or three minutes, you know, this person likely, and unless he's caught somewhere else, okay, has got a problem getting up and getting to you. All right, or he's assisted all the way. So the time up and go certainly has got two components. The quantitative component is uh, something that we measure if we are doing studies or when you want to, in your mind, take a look at whether this person has a high risk or false. But actually, the other thing that uh, we practice is actually looking at the quality of that walk. Okay, so you, you don't walk like a model. But if the person's walk, okay, the gait is actually very abnormal, neurologically or musculoskeletal, you know this person is going to be at high risk of force. So I'll give you the next um, naughty, okay. I always tell Wai Chang that all my talks have got cheeky things. So I shall be a little bit more tempered today because I always have to remind myself that this is actually recorded. So I will say that, uh, you know, for people with gait issues, uh, certainly you must look at them. The other uh, picture here is actually of the SACF questionnaire. It's actually a self-administered uh, questionnaire. Um, I know that a lot of you might not actually, uh, if you're practicing in a clinic setting, you might not um, have the luxury of uh, administrating this, but um, for the people who are doing daycare, part of that exercise in your mind, even if you don't want to score it, okay, is to look at the person whether they have strength, whether they have uh, issues uh, with getting up from the chair, whether the person can even climb stairs if you have got stairs even in daycare, okay, and whether there's a, a person who had fallen before, all right? So the sarcasm is actually very straightforward. And actually in your mind, you can score them straight away. So just to finish Auntie G, uh, before we move on, I think uh, I might actually be halfway through already. Isn't that spectacular? Let's see, well, am I good for time? We're only like 20 minutes into this talk, right? So I, I thought that, you know, um, for preaching purposes, uh, this lady needed a walking aid, actually. And I felt that, you know, all of us, if we had not had a chance to uh, uh, embrace geriatric care or geriatric learning, okay, uh, how do we then recommend a walking aid, whether the walking aid is appropriate, okay? So uh, this is maybe your next uh, picture moment. Uh, whip out your phones and take a photograph of how we want to recommend what is the proper height, uh, how do you use the walking aid appropriately. Uh, for the people who are actually having uh, loved ones at home who are using a walking aid, your chance is to practice when you uh, visit them or see them later, all right? Okay. So let's come to the ones that are also easily tackled when the person is set, uh, seen in the community. I certainly do not encourage any kind of uh, footwear like that, okay, um, uh, on females. And I tell you, I was just telling Wai Chong that if you see a male wearing one of these, right, you really need to see whether you need to examine his cognition. But this kind of footwear is a no-no, okay, um, when the person gets uh, much older. What you would want to maybe encourage is that they have proper footwear. Uh, in the podiatrist, a few sentences, it should definitely uh, be covered if you're diabetic or if the patient is diabetic. Cover at least two, two thirds of the forefoot. Make it make sure that it's properly laced so that you can apply the shoe appropriately onto the foot or it can be velcroed. Um, there must be actually a, a, a back support. Okay, so actually this pair of sanders uh, on your right can be appropriate for a female. Uh, obviously, for males also, uh, you would want that, uh, you know, if they're wearing sandals, there must be some back support, okay, and obviously a non-slip so okay, so this is actually footwear, so if you see uncle and auntie walking into your clinic or walking into daycare with a, a pair of slippers, I, I, I don't see this kind of slippers very often in an older person, but just the slip-ons, those are still dangerous, I would do, I would still encourage bare minimum, so to speak, is a pair of sandals with proper strapping, if not, then these are really much safer. Having said that, right, Auntie out here uh, being so uh, so poor, so to speak, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, all of us are in the same categories, right? Uh, I've worked on the, my trainers for so long, right? I think I've actually worn it for over a year and a half. It's so smooth that now, even when I walk on normal floor, right, I, I tend to skate. So please do look at the soles. If they're all complete worn, please change that pair of shoes. 
All right. So how do I then tie in the next topic? Um, force, as I said, was my passionate uh, first self. We now come to frailty. And the reason why we want to talk about frailty is because actually when a person falls, the next thing you want to directly connect in your brain is this person is going to be frail until proven otherwise. All right. I mean, if you fall, I won't call you frail. Lah, huh? You want to be caught frail, then I better look at you, right? But most people who are 65 and above who starts falling or have a recurrent fall, there has to be a pattern to this. If you can't find that pattern, I mean, if forever you keep tripping on the on, on the toilet, uh, uh, at the toilet, Okay, you better bless the toilet. If not, please change the environment. But if the person falls for no right reason or there's a pattern getting up or whatever it is that they're doing, okay, think about whether you need to remove an environmental issue or is there a, a, maybe a cardiac condition that keeps uh, getting the person to fall? Or finally, is there a generalized issue with the person and that is actually frailty? Okay, so in severe frailty situations, the person doesn't even need any kind of trigger for them to just fall down. All right, so these are people who are severely frail. So let me tell you, uh, unfortunately, the personal experience is my mom. She just fell a few days ago. And that's because she survived cancer, but did not survive COVID in that sense. COVID took away all her uh, initiation to eat. So actually, everybody says COVID is like a flu today. But in the older person, my personal experience with all the patients I've cared for, and especially for mom, the devastating effects that I left behind. And I thought that this is another so-called uh, picture moment. Not picture though. I mean, it's actually words moment. Number one is cognition tends to be screwed. La. <laughs> so if the person is already borderline cognitively impaired, as I said, mom survived chemo. She didn't even have a chemo brain, you know, so to speak. She was still happy, chirpy, and so on and so forth. With COVID, right, that last 5% went, and there was some evidence that COVID takes away 5% of your brain power, so to speak. She became cognitively impaired. She was so badly dis. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, anorexic, right? She stopped eating for six months. Auntie here being cheeky, of course, went to ask around and I gave her me gaze and she recovered somewhat in terms of eating. Um, and But I can tell you that through that few months and actually one year and a half now into uh, post-COVID, she has lost so much muscle mass and le recently with delirium, she was also more chair bound. And uh, despite all the community effort, I actually admitted her to community hospital. She did quite a bit more exercise than she used to. But even when she got home one week later, she was on the floor. And when I asked her what has happened, she said, I don't know. I just went down. All right. So she's actually severely frail. So it's actually heartbreaking to see our older persons like that. And I mean, if it hits your grandmother, so to speak, right? In this case, it's my mom. Actually, when it hits home, it scares the daylights out of me. Despite the fact that I see all the fractured hips in the hospital. Well, not, not currently, but I used to. I'm now covering general geriatric wards. Uh, it, does, it does scare the bananas out of you, all right? And that evening, I was just wondering when my husband was driving me to her, did she fracture her hip, huh? Will she have a head injury, huh? Is there going to be a subdural, huh? So the ha, ha, ha. I think God has been really good. I think there's a big fat bruise still on her, or, or, on her, the back of her head. But so far, she was moving all right. And um, head injury advice was given, so to speak. <laughs> and so far, God is good. I mean, she's still at home. So please, you know, think about all these people um, when you actually look at a person who has fallen. So how do we then tie the whole thing in? And why does Lydia I want to make you bored, you know, with all this talk? It's because it starts actually from the left. Sarcopenia actually uh, 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 is the, the starting of natural aging of the muscle. It usually starts when they are 50. So Auntie Ao here, although you don't see me very much, actually Auntie Ao can claim to be sarcopenic. I have got some problems getting up from the floor, probably because you didn't realize I'm also very fat. But anyway, so sarcopenia starts when you are actually about 50s, all right? And there's actually a, a, a aging and the muscle uh, strength is actually getting lesser. And then with that, you know, you slow down in gait speed, you have poorer balance. And finally, frailty, which actually is a syndrome. Okay, the, the definition uh, is kind of on the right. There are deficits accumulation. You, uh, there's uh, quite a lot more fatigue. Sedentary behavior makes it worse. I wish there was weight loss for me, I mean, and cognitive impairment. And, you know, finally, if you're not moving around very much, there will be social isolation. So for all of us who actually practice home care, um, I'm, I'm sure you do see the social isolation in some of our patients, uh, even those who are still cognitively intact, okay? And this is part and parcel of the whole syndrome of frailty. So maybe a, a quick look at what is the definition of frailty. It's actually an increased vulnerability to poor uh, resolution of homostasis. So many words, right? But 
as I say, a picture paints a thousand words. So if you remember Auntie G, she looks frail, all right? Every time you see somebody like that, please don't go around and push her down, okay? She will sure fall, okay? So how, um, uh, how, how do you then look at these people? People who present with falls, people who have high risk of delirium or who have been de in delirium before, please think about this word frailty, all right? So I wanted to then maybe bring you up to speed a little bit about what the national guidelines are going to be for geriatric frailty. Uh, we are going to use the CFS actually as a screening tool rather than an assessment. And this is how it looks like. I really will encourage you to maybe look at on your handphone and maybe take a copy of this because it's just not about the pictures that you see in black, but to read the words as well. We are now looking at CSF4, which hopefully in Singapore we can start targeting. So let me just read out to you what CFS4 is all about. It says that we are not dependent on others for daily help. Often symptoms limit activities. A common complaint is being slowed up or being tired during the day. It sounds like you and me, but I know you're not frail, but I, I want to believe that I'm getting vulnerable. <laughs> but the Mali frail people are the, then the, the, the ones that you might start thinking, thinking about cognition because it reads this in uh, CFS5, Mali frail people. These people often have more evidence of slowing, needs help in high order IADLs like finance, which you know, might not actually nowadays need you to get to the bank or the ATM, transportation, heavy housework or medications. If you actually talk about medications and finance, you then know that actually cognition is now being questioned. All right, so your IADL starts falling off the cliff, all right? And malfrality progressively impairs shopping, obviously, and walking outside alone meal preparations and housework. So my mom has not been doing that for the last three years since her cancer. So she's, uh, you know, in my opinion, you know, already mali frail, uh, you know, about five years ago. So if the person is not physically frail, people can still be frail when they have dementia. So this chart is going to be our clinical frailty scale for the national screening tool. And I would encourage all of us to actually uh, uh, have some knowledge about this, all right? In the NUP, just to bring all of you at speed, uh, the four um, NUPs that I work with, uh, they use a frail scale. This is, again, another screening tool. It is equally useful. And the reason why I brought it up is because with each of the alphabet, actually, there is an algorithm behind it to tell you what to do with it. All right. So um, if you are interested, you know, you have NUP friends, by all means, ask them. If not, uh, you know, um, I can make that available to you uh, with the with the permission of the NUP people. Okay, so I wanted to just maybe, uh, in, in case we know we miss the forest for the trees, right? There are differential diagnoses of frailty. This is a whole long list. And some of it is actually, I would hope to say, okay, it is reversible or is detectable and is treatable. So please do not miss the thyroid problems. Please do not uh, uh, forget that diabetes people actually is a systemic disease and you need to do a lot more with them because they're actually literally frail in that sense when diabetes starts, all right? Not physically, but it will come, it will get there, all right? And these are the other things like neurological disease, you know, vascular dementia, so on and so forth, all right? Uh, so common conditions that are in the older person with weight loss, weakness, and impaired functional abilities include all these. Now, um, I have brought up some of the local papers. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, Prof Ng actually did a, a, a longitudinal look at this. And uh, there is actually some hope. And that hope is going to be summarized, okay, in the next uh, stack of uh, slides that is coming up here. And it's going to be all meshed together because truly, you, you can't give a super pill for this, okay? We really need to do a few strategies and they're common across the frailty, the osteoporosis and the false arena. That's why I wanted to bring all this together for us to have one common, uh, uh, I won't say one common, but some commonalities, okay, in terms of treatment. So if you actually do the physical exercise, looking at nutrition and, you know, hopefully, you know, detect the cognition and do something about it, there is a chance that we can reverse some of the frailty effects. So the next thing that, uh, you know, this is just a pretend to make sure that my, my, my talk is not in the air. We base a lot of this on uh, the papers that have been published. This is the Asia Pacific Clinical Practice Guidelines uh, for the Management of Frailty. And now is my, what do you call it? Uh, advertisement moment. 
in October, uh, the Geriatric Society uh, will be hosting the uh, Regional Asia Pacific Frailty Conference. I can't remember how, how the whole sentence works, but it's going to be at the end of October. I really hope that you know some of us who are actually interested, please sign up for it. Uh, it's very practical based. Uh, again, Auntie Ao here will be talking, but not in this context. Um, some of it maybe. And uh, there's actually a lot more uh, uh, information there. And we, it's really Singapore in terms of frailty work. We are actually in a national, international and uh, Southeast Asian uh, arena. Uh, the good work all being done by a, a big national team. And some of these are our doctors, Lim Wee Siong and uh, even Rashma. Uh, a lot of papers have been published by them. So please, you know, I encourage all of you, if you can, October, the end part, I think it's 26, 27 or 28 or somewhere there. Please come and attend. The only other thing that I can tell you is it's downtown. <laughs> so if you want to go to Raffles City later for lunch or dinner, they are very close. So let's talk about a bit of interventions across the first two things, the force and the frailty. I like this, and this is actually a courtesy of Abbott. Uh, they actually run a course usually uh, until they stopped it during COVID. Um, this is actually what I felt was a very nice representation of what we really need to do. Please look at the foundation called basic nutrition and look at the roof, which is exercise. I always felt that the exercise is appropriately at the roof because auntie out here does not like to exercise and I, I don't want to reach for the sky. So I only get stuck at nutrition. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to then introduce to you the European Society for Clinical Nutrition. What are the recommendations today uh, for frailty, for sarcopenia? Okay, it would be actually a, a protein intake of 1 to 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight. So if uh, you are 50 kg, 40 kg, you just need about 40 grams. And if your uh, 12 times table is much better than mine, you will need 48 if you're 40 kg. Okay, so for people who are severely malnourished with no very bad kidney disease, we do encourage up to 1.5 even. All right, so please, there's a disclaimer down there. Older people with uh, significant renal impairment, please don't try this. You might actually drive up the creatinine. I've done that before. However, having said that, people usually classify CKD. So CKD 3B, 3A, 3 whatever it is, I have actually successfully given them 1.2 without um, harming the kidneys, all right? Um, there is some um, suggestion that protein cannot be taken at one shot like a pill, you no know, 30 milligrams at one shot probably nothing will be absorbed, maybe maybe one gram. It's suggested that you space out nicely, all right, over three meals if you're taking it with a meal. Recently, I had the uh, privilege of meeting one of the Aspion authors. So he was actually very um, clear in how he said that I should actually do this in the hospital setting, maybe. He says that after the dinner, you should then give the ONS uh, just before sleep if uh, no uh, fluid is not a big issue because he says that you are trying not to have the person at an over, overly fasted period until the next day. So that is what I'm actually trying to do today, but it's actually not really successful because to drink that much ONS, um, obviously one bottle of ONS, if you and I know, is uh, oral nutritional supplements. They usually come in 200 mils bottle, but you no, know, I'm trying maybe to consider maybe prescribing 50 mils or 100 mils of that you know, before the patient sleeps. So all these are actually ways and means of um, doing research, I guess. The Aspian author did tell me that food first, which is what I wish could happen because, you know, to buy ONS is actually severely expensive in my opinion. I buy that from my mom and I'm a cheapo. I felt that $2.80 for Angela is already quite steep and I buy her powder instead. But having said that, uh, food first is very difficult to achieve the appropriate amount of protein. So if the patient is severely frail and the pocket is quite deep, you might want to still consider the ONS. Now, so food first, right? How does it look like for 20 grams? None of us eat this, I think. Okay, okay, uh, you can eat the chicken thigh. But can you imagine the number of egg whites? I, I mean, I don't mind, but you know, most of us probably won't eat that many egg whites and tofu and yogurt, yuck, yuck and yuck, right? So, you know, this is a uh, product advertisement here. Uh, we use quite a bit of Ensure. Uh, we also have Nestle in our uh, in our regular formulary nowadays. So we are quite blessed. It's not just Yakut anymore. Uh, but certainly, you know, for the people at home, I've actually told them that, you know, Ensure Powder or even uh, Boost Optimum, blah, blah. Okay, any of these, okay? As long as the protein or content meets maybe even just one third and the rest are food first, it might still be a doable thing. But it is really very expensive to eat protein. For all of you who have actually want to do keto diets, right? <laughs> you will realize that protein is expensive. 
Okay, so let's come a little bit into uh, exercise. Exercise actually probably is one of those uh, evidence A, level A, A plus, A star, A, whatever it is, okay? Uh, uh, recommendations for frailty, for force, for sarcopenia. Truly, I'm not kidding. So what are the exercises that, you know, we have got four types of exercises, but the exercise, you no, know, the exercise that rules it all, right? is actually resistance training. This is resistance training in this most simple form. Please do not drop the dumbbell on your toes. I mean, not on anybody's toes, it hurts, all right? But if there's a person who is not really motivated, at least try sit to stand because that really helps with the lower limb. That helps with the proximal muscles, the quads, okay? And it uses just your body weight. Half squats are, I feel, more uh, difficult to do. Uh, they can actually still uh, misbalance and fall backwards, okay? So holding down um, um, is difficult. The other alternative I've tried before myself is actually to do a wall sit. Wall sit up to one minute, three times a day. That was not anybody's recommendation except Lydia Ao because when I'm superly uh, uh, vain pot, okay, and I remember to do sit to stand, I do it at my office uh, wall. But I can tell you that sit to uh, sit, uh, wall, wall sits, okay, can be quite challenging for your legs. And please wear some footwear. So Auntie Ao was actually doing it at home without footwear and I slide straight to the floor and hit my bum. Okay. I put balance training because it's all about uh, exercise at the moment, but balance training is specifically more for force. This is how you do balance training. Uh, actually, um, previously, uh, we actually taught balance, but actually balance is something that I sometimes will be a little bit more hesitant to ask a person to do when they're alone and they're elderly because you certainly would fall. Okay, so balance training is something that maybe you can do with somebody with a carer. Okay, I wanted to then... Um, maybe take, make it a point to tell you all that please, all these things, if you can't recommend it, there are now gym tonic, okay? This is actually an exercise uh, a program that is held in the community. I wanted you all to know that there are all these programs out there that you should assess and please assess and it's actually via AIC. If not, you know, our HNF colleagues can point you to the correct direction. If not, you know, they can put you in their daycare centers, not you, but your patients, okay, into some of these exercise programs. So what is gym tonic? It's also called Uncle Auntie Gym, all right? It's for our Pioneer and Medeca generations. It certainly works a lot more, uh, hopefully, on strength, all right? And uh, they use uh, uh, gym equipment as well. Not the ones that you see for uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, but certainly it does create resistance from our older persons, all right? Uh, the other thing that I thought as a good Singapore citizen, I must uh, support Active SG. Please uh, go and look at their websites. They are actually heck of a lot of uh, stuff they have put up there. And really, we want to keep everybody healthy before you go down the pre field uh, route. So for some of us who are very young here, you say, hi, yeah, this video, I'll talk, talk, talk. It doesn't uh, really uh, make relevance. But if you look at your parents, your grandparents were at home with you today. Uh, if they are really very good, please preserve Okay, preserve what we call the intrinsic capacity because you know we certainly want them to be really healthy and have great quality of life as they age. Okay, there are other seven easy exercises, okay, uh, to an active lifestyle. So this is what it looks like. Uh, you know, again, sit to stand is what I like because it really only needs you to be able to stand and don't fall. I wanted to, again, uh, this is the fourth time I'm talking about medication. Please look at medication. Uh, there are some tools. Actually, um, if you ever are interested, I ask Wai Chan to invite Jasmine. She does a marvelous talk on um, medication and polypharmacy, and she's an expert in that. Um, so, you know, if you want, maybe Wai Chan one day, you can actually talk to Jasmine, and we can have that talk for you all as well. Good idea. Uh, yeah. So let's look a little bit on vitamin D supplementation. Supplementation. So actually, to me, to me, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about oh, what protein is great, you know, and how we can get it, and uh, how is it easy to pop a pill. If there's one pill to pop, and you know, previously vitamin D was marketed as everything from cancer curing to whatever, but its primary aim really is to absorb calcium properly, and there is some pro uh, there's some uh, 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 evidence that it does help with muscle strength. This is what it should be when you have a person with deficiency. Uh, vitamin D, actually the half size is only up to three weeks. Uh, this was how you will want to do a bit of the calculation that I promised that I put up here. For every 100 international units of vitamin D, okay, to increase, we actually have to actually give them so much 100 international units to raise it by one nanogram per meal. So Wai Chang did ask me, uh, Lydia Awa, testing vitamin D in the community is very expensive. Leh. I said, I agree. Even on our site, right? If I don't have to do it, I don't have to do it. 
but I know that the essay itself can cost up to $100, which is called a total waste of money. But we, we have recognized and actually there are local studies that show that our older persons are vitamin D deficient. So if they don't mind paying for it, okay, don't mind paying for it, you can do one testing. I have actually loaded people before, 4,000 international units, meaning that they are taking four tablets if you don't mind the pill count. The other way that we load is using 25,000 international units once a week and then change it to once a month. All right. So these are different types of preparation. Whatever it is, you have to give enough. So 4,000 to me is loading. You can load it for up to eight weeks. And then if you are so worried about toxicity, then cut it back, put down to 1,000 for maintenance. I had a quick... Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, summary in terms of why 1,000. 1,000 is actually the maintenance dose for older people who have already repleted. But you know, if uh, you and I know how, how many of us go and sun ourselves, definitely not me. And I will tell you that please don't say, Lydia, I'll ask you to go and sun yourself until you're child. Ta. That's not my aim. Ah. But usually if you want to sun yourself, the older person's skin is not so efficient, but you might want to sun yourself 15 minutes to 20 minutes in a uh, 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 normal exposed area. So you don't go and go stuck naked outside and then sun yourself and then say, Lydia, I'll say so. But please, uh, you know, just normal clothes, okay, uh, covered, but the uncovered parts, the face, the neck, the arms and the legs, 15 minutes to 20 minutes before 10 or after 3. Why I avoid 10 to 3 is because I don't want to be child time and I don't want age spots on me. All right, so that's how you want to get vitamin D from the sun itself. It's very hard to get hypercalcemia from uh, vitamin D toxicity, but you know, that is the level that people have noticed toxicity. Um, and if the person gets uh, progressively renal impaired, then you might actually run into toxicity itself. Okay, so I'm coming back to the last, maybe don't know how many slides, and we are already running a little bit late now. We are at 14.46. So I'm going to go even faster. So people who fall would likely fracture, hof uh, hopefully not actually. But the chances of you fracturing without a fall is actually lesser, obviously. Okay, and actually the, 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 the next thing I want to highlight is Singapore is always known for not good things. The only good thing we're good for is food and maybe transport. But the bad thing we seem to be very famous for is hip fractures. We are going to be the highest in the whole of Asia. And uh, it's going to be 5 four over 30 years. So the statistics are on your right. It's sad though. All right, because we don't want to be good for the bad things. Now, um, so how do you then start having the next alarm bell ringing? People who have previously fallen will fall. People, people with previous fracture will fracture again. So these are the two things. When you get a history like that, you know that this person is going to be high risk. So that, that is why you ask a person, have you fallen? Have you fractured? Because all the two Fs, okay, they are partners in crime. All right, people who have smoked, Lactose intolerance is only because all this life, if you don't drink milk, you don't even get the vitamins and the calcium then. Unless you take calcium high food, lah, all right? Uh, then, you know, there's a lesser chance that you're going to be calcium deficient and vitamin D deficiency. So this is the burden of osteoporosis, fractures, you know, the, uh, uh, fear of falling. Okay, then you get ADL in uh, uh, dependency. So... The last part will be to remind us how do we assess osteoporosis, how do we treat, and uh, how do we maybe stop osteoporosis medicines. So where are the fractures usually? The vertebrae, and this is actually a uh, runoff uh, from uh, the bone mineral uh, paper that I picked up a while ago in 2007. The most common is still the vertebrae. So the shorter the person gets, okay, you'll be asking. So two inch over their lifetime, you might want to really consider whether the person actually has osteoporosis. Okay, so this looks visually, I love vision uh, or vi uh, visual cues. So if you find an ama who walks to you, do you like the other ama? Please, all your alarm bells must be ringing until you're deaf. Either that or you're actually dumb. Okay, please, if you see these kind of people, you know that they're osteoporotic. If they are actually not on treatment and there's no constraints about treating them, then please consider assessing and treating. So why is there osteoporosis? Basically, there's a lot of remodeling. There's a lot of structural deterioration. So from a beautiful, this is a micrograph of a normal bone with beautiful bridges and nice, well-formed, uniform holes, it becomes driftwood. It looks exactly like that, okay, if a person is severely osteoporotic. Now, how do you make a diagnosis uh, in today's uh, setting? It's still a bit costly. It's $100, I think, if I'm not wrong, and I don't think it's subsidized uh, in the polyclinic. I'm not sure. Okay, so bad statement to say. But I know that it's about $100 still. 
and this is uh, 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 the DEXA that we actually have. There's a DEXA bus that goes around the polyclinics, and I think that it might actually be available in the community. But whatever it is, I just want to make a note. If you are actually using one machine, please go back to the same machine if possible. Logistically, quite challenging, but try anyway. Okay, so this is actually, um, um, this everybody would know, but I just put it up so that, you know, if you want referencing again, you know, whip up your phone and take a photograph. If not, uh, you know, it's actually easily av available online. And this is actually uh, up to date uh, a picture uh, table on what is classified as osteoporosis and what is not and what is normal. All right. I wanted to then maybe uh, bring to attention again that FRAX scoring, this is FRAX, okay, it's actually an electronic uh, uh, fracture assessment uh, risk score. And this is available for the Singapore data. Please don't anyhow go and FRAX people using Sweden data or whatever data. We have Singapore data. Please go on and try it, all right? Uh, this actually assess the person's risk of fracturing in the next 10 years, all right? And the parameters that you have to key in truly are just the 10, age, sex. Actually, uh, people shouldn't call it sex. They call it gender. But anyway, weight, height, previous fracture, uh, parent fracture, current smoking status, glucocorticoids, alcohol, femoral neck, BMB. Even if you don't have this and you put it in, it seems that this can be pretty accurate. Okay? So when do you treat uh, the major osteoporotic uh, risk if it's more than 20% or the hip fracture is 3%. All right? So we come to tackling osteoporosis now and it is, it is always there if the person uh, already has those risk factors we talk about. It becomes a secondary prevention if the patient has fractured. If a person has fallen without fracturing, then it becomes primary prevention. But if you have a fall, we had that picture just now that if you have a fall, if you have fallen, the risk of fracturing is higher in an older person. So that's why osteoporosis is part of the culprits, right? So exercise, diet, healthy lifestyle choice. This is really the pillar of what our HPB and uh, Singapore A uh, Active HG is trying to do. But is walking, is, still, is walking still the best exercise? If you didn't listen to me just now, and you know that this answer should be wrong, what is the best exercise? It's resistance exercise, okay? Uh, okay, la, okay. La. Uh, for osteoporosis, actually any exercise that's weight bearing is great, okay? But can you imagine this poor little worm trying to walk very fast? Gosh, they trip over all his feet. I thought that this was a quick and fast dirty table to remind us when is your next red flag. So many red flags, right? But how do you then want to consider a person for treatment? These are the few things that I would look at. Actually, I see everybody 75 and above. So age wasn't a big deal with me. So, But people who have fallen before high-risk neurological disease, for instance, if you send a person for BMD, the T-score is already osteoporotic, all right? Past history of fracture, past history of falls. Uh, these are high-risk patients. Now, when do we start? For sure, if the person had fragility fracture, if the T-score is already osteoporotic or uh, people who are osteopenic but high fracture risk. Okay, so you use the FRAX, you measure it. If these people are in the high risk category, please consider treatment. Before you treat, uh, uh, you want to correct the hypocalcemia, the vitamin Ds, okay, and make sure that the kidney function is calculated. I want to then maybe acknowledge that in geriatrics, we don't use uh, GFR. We actually use CCT, it's a calculated uh, uh, creatinine clearance. It's called creatinine, Crockroft's creatinine clearance. And it's age minus weight over something, something. <laughs> I used to remember this, but you remember I said I got STML. And then dental screening. The ABSMR uh, criteria does not ask for a dental screening anymore. In, I mean, not, not that they is a mandatory thing, but it's good practice to do so. If the patient has got black teeth everywhere, uh, and it's not because you're eating squid ink uh, spaghetti or, or it's very curious, okay, please don't start these people first. You might want to really want to do a dental clearance. Caries carry, uh, obviously, bacteria and the bone is actually in active remodeling because of all the uh, all the, uh, the bacteria being there. So if you actually give osteoporosis medicines, the anti resorptives actually cause problems, all right? So in any normal person, if you have the, the opportunity, at least look at their FBC, liver function, renal panel, bone biochemistry, and the vitamin D, all right? So if you are really going to treat osteoporosis, unfortunately, you might not be able to run away from getting a level of vitamin D. Anything above 20, you can try. We are usually trying to hit 30 before we start any injections, but oral uh, uh, bisphos 20 is probably a good, 
number to start with, all right? Uh, just for completeness sake, we must always remember that there are secondary causes of osteoporosis. Age is not the only thing. Um, and this is actually uh, uh, an, another so-called photo moment, if you want to take a photograph of this. I wanted to just give you an a, a understanding of the types of medicines being used in osteoporosis. We know that bone is always in a, 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 a flux, right? So from the resting stage, you eat up all the bad bones. So if you have a lot of caries, you are trying to get rid of all that. Okay, then, you know, uh, the osteoblast uh, is then being recruited to rebuild the bone and then you have beautiful bone. So you can hit it at here or you can hit it, not hit it, but then or you complement it here. So let's talk a little bit about the medicines. Now today, up to today, uh, bisphos is still the gold standard of treatment is really good for spine and hip uh, uh, osteoporosis. Um, we are, I put this table up here. Uh, I think this is actually uh, found in the ACE guidelines from Singapore. You can just Google that. Actually, you cannot say Google. You can search that on the internet and you'll be able to find all these on the ACE guidelines uh, on the MO, MOH website, right? So um, I just want to highlight that when the creatinine clearance today, drops below 30, I will be very hesitant to use this. Uh, hypocalcemia, people with esophageal or gastric abnormalities. Nowadays, uh, can I just warn you, those young doctors or young people who are going to treat this, uh, a lot of our younger to middle age nowadays are going for bariatric surgery. So people with bariatric surgery, you don't give them this force, okay, please. Now, uh, whenever we give medicines, there are some things to look out for. Uh, sometimes if you give uh, intravenous, I, I have actually given residurinate uh, once a month and the people went into severe flu-like symptoms. For oral residurinate, uh, somebody had so bad diarrhea that I had to admit them twice in a row and I thought it was just coincidence. The next dose I gave, they ended up in hospital again, so I had to stop that. Uh, for intravenous, there's a little bit of association of risk with uh, atrial fibrillation. Now, these are the ones that are a little bit so-called more scary. It has always been blown out of proportion, but... We still need to mention it because it has happened. Atypical femur fractures, all right? Usually, uh, a person has to be on the medicine for quite a number of years, at least, uh, at least an average of seven years, okay? But uh, it's actually an atypical fracture. And um, actually, there are actually some alarm bells uh, before the person actually cracks. Uh. I mentioned again about dental because dental is something that we should easily look at, open their mouths. I mean, besides a good set of dentures, anything that's black and dirty, you might want to reconsider starting until you get dental. All right. So this was actually a flow diagram that is also picked up from ACE. Um, I will go into that uh, or I will highlight some of how we want to start or stop. So just before we carry on with the next few of slides, we, you will ask me, so Dr. Ao, a few of the slides must have mentioned something called high risk. When do you consider a person high risk? When the BMD is uh, less than minus 3.8 or the person is quite old, more than 72 years old, previous fracture we told you about, especially vertebral fractures, people on glucocorticoids, they mentioned rheumatoid arthritis, okay? Anybody who you think that you had to give glucocorticoids for more than five uh, months or six months, you want to consider, all right? And uh, or... If, you know, uh, people who have actually uh, uh, been in high risk, you want to treat for at least up to 10 years, you might want to actually then stop after 10 years and then use another agent. So we do have other agents that we're going to talk about. So stopping this force, this is actually what I've actually just said, all right? I wanted to say that this is something that you can get in any kind of community setting. You ask the person, or uh, if the person consistently complain of thigh pain, especially those doing rehab, if you have over strenuous uh, exercise, then don't say lah. But if out of the blue, they come and say, hey, I've got thigh pain, and you take a quick look at the medication and the person is on bisphos, please maybe consider that this could be actually the starting of an atypical fracture uh, 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 history. All right. And uh, for the orthopedic surgeons, they are very careful nowadays. If the person had one atypical fracture, they will actually scan the other side and see whether they need to fix it before it, it breaks, all right? So the next one, all right, the Nusuma has come into play for the last 10 years. It's actually a rank inhibitor. And uh, it actually inhibits one of the things that stimulates the osteoclast. Remember the bone-eating medicine, uh, bone-eating cell, all right? The most important thing is that you better make sure that they're not hypocalcemic. So Auntie Ao again has created mistakes before. I've given one of my little aunties one of these things. She keeps telling me, 
Hey, Dr. Oh, Dr. Oh, very tingling, very tingling every time you, you hit me with it, you know. So I said, no leh, no leh. You know, um, um, I thought everything was normal. But I realized that actually maybe, maybe, um, although I checked her calcium, she was borderline low. So I don't know whether she had actually uh, some form of uh, 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 um, tetany of some sort, you know, when I actually gave it to her. Anyway, make sure that the calcium and vitamin D intake is actually appropriate. All right. And these are actually the, the cautions, pre-existing eczema. I highlight that uh, uh, a bit later. Now, then, you know, with bisphos, because actually alindronate uh, was the reported one that can stay in your bone for quite a long time, up to two, three years, so you can afford a bone holiday. With the nusamab, it does not work. Once you stop it, the, the, uh, the degradation begins, all right? So uh, the effects of a uh, the, positiv uh, the positivity of the nusumet starts going down once you stop the medicine, all right? And the bone turnover markers actually increase quite remarkably. Now, so is actually the nusumet safe? In your setting, when you are actually receiving patients with dunosumab, uh, sometimes you realize that they get recurrent UTI because there's actually poor or suboptimal tissue specificity. I had sent a few people into uh, eczema before or people with previous 15 years ago, endogenous eczema set up beautifully, 15 years, pristine skin. I gave dunosumab after the second dose, everything flat. So I had to store, uh, stop that, all right? The third one is actually teriparatide. Now, this is the first osteoblastic, meaning that it bone forms, okay, rather than stop the bone from being eaten up. This is a bone formation medicine. The only bad thing about it is actually truly costly. It's still running about 1,007 per month. You only give 18 months to two years because actually in the research, if you are rat, you get osteosarcopenia, uh, osteosarcoma. But since we are still not rats, but we are humans, but you, you are as scared as the rat, then I would suggest that unless you are very good at uh, this work, like endocrinologists, some people have given a lot more than two years, we would usually stop by two, uh, uh, by two years or 18 months, all right? Again, CCT is an issue. And uh, before you want to give these kind of things, all right, uh, Paget's disease of the bone, uh, increased alkaline phosphatase, all these should be actually investigated before uh, you give this. There is actually a caution, all right, uh, is a, a referral to the specialist should be considered before you want to start this. Now, parathyroid hormone is subcutaneous, so you get a jab every single day. It's called Demsian. So a lot of the people did not opt for this. Okay, so this is actually the osteoporosis care algorithm. It looks really busy. Auntie, I was not going to ask you to look at it today, but actually it's also on the ACE guidelines that has been published uh, three years ago. Now, when do we actually, uh, how do we do treatment monitoring? Uh, you know, you do want to see that there is some improvement up to one to 3% when you start giving this force, all right? And BMD can be considered every two to three years later. Now, if actually the person is taking medicine and your BMD continues to go backwards, uh, something is not happening, okay? So there are actually a few things that you should look at. Number one is, was the calcium and vitamin D well repleted before you start? Number two is, did the patient take it correctly if you are on the oral bisphos, okay? What is successful? Obviously, if the BMD is stable or increasing, we are talking about 1% to 3% just now. Bone turnover markers, which none of Auntie L does it before. But a lot of our endocrine colleagues actually do do this. And this is actually quite a bit of work, in my opinion. And um, actually, the person who had fractured once despite being on treatment, please don't give up. But if you keep having fractures, especially vertebral fractures, then something really is going wrong. All right. So the universal recommendations is please take your vitamin D, please take your calcium. Uh, Wai Chong has asked me before, how much calcium is calcium? I will still stick with the 1,000 uh, milligrams of calcium or 700, depending on how much you want to take and whether you get constipated. There's no evidence to say that the CV risk is remarkably high at 1,000. Uh, but, you know, certainly you're not crazy enough to take 2,000 and get renal stones. Uh. Okay, so, you know, I think the recommended daily uh, uh, RDA is actually 700 to 1,000, depending on how old you are. Okay, now I, I wanted to highlight this which I actually read religiously every year. Endocrine Society, this is the American Geriatric uh, Endocrine Society. They do publish uh, uh, the uh, osteoporosis guidelines. I like the way that they represented it. And I thought that I would highlight to you some of the resources that I actually go to when I have to give a talk. All right. 
I thought that this is actually of some note that even in very frail patients, although I didn't think that 74 was frail, all right, this is a longitudinal study from Taiwan. So don't say that they are all Ang Mo. This is actually Chinese, all right. There is some uh, mortality improvement when you uh, the person has been taking anti resorptives all right. Finally, the last three slides, actually last one. Uh, I asked uh, Amgen for this slide because this is the newest kit on the market. Okay, it's called Evanity. Auntie L has not used it before, <laughs> only because although they do have uh, uh, patient name samples and so on and so forth, I, I, um, I grapple with the cost. It's actually uh, uh, supposed to be less costly than teriparatide. Um, but in, in, in my context, I'm actually waiting for everything to happen before I try it. So I'm a, quite a kiasu person. But they have actually had contraindications mentioned here, which I thought I would highlight. So people with poor calcium levels, please don't give. People obviously with known drug sensitivity, you are sell if you give it. And uh, people, uh, th this is actually a relative contraindication, but because all our patients seem to have heart attacks until proven otherwise, MI and stroke people, uh, we tend not to give it. So you, you can imagine why Lydia Al does not dare to give this because you throw one stone, or most of our older person will probably have an ischemic heart disease or strokes. Okay, so with this, I'm going to end this talk and then we can start taking questions. Wei Chong, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Lydia. Um, thank you for the excellent lecture. Very informative, very clinically useful. Um, I have read through the questions. I could say that there are roughly like four or five categories. Uh. There are a few questions related to postural hypotension, some questions related to diabetic footwear, okay. um, some questions related to fall risk assessment, and then there are yet others. Uh. So maybe could you like to address um, the one on postural hypotension? The question is about... Uh, like using fludrocortisone and um, uh, aminodrine and yeah. stockings, you know, for man yeah. management of postural hypertension. What's your experience? So, you know, uh, um, I, I think uh, Wai Chong uh, is now uh, um, uh, working with my colleague or my ex-colleague, uh, Yen Lei. And she had a very nice mnemonic, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, and I only can remember something. Okay, A, B, C, D, E of managing postural hypotension. One yeah. is abdominal binder. So if you also want to look slim and pretty, you can try abdominal binders, which I think Singapore too hot, too tight, cannot. The other things that I will actually caution about is stockings. Uh, stockings, um, if you don't apply it appropriately, especially for those TED stockings that we see, there will be a lot of skin uh, uh, damage and you can actually have a whole lot of necrosis there. So wearing stockings, in my opinion, uh, it can be very hot. If you are using very tight stocking, resistant stocking, so to speak, just be really careful with the application. So it then comes down to, is there enough fluid that the person is taking? Uh, a lot of our older folks don't take enough. And then of course, you know, if they are in severe heart failure, then how to take? Then finally, it comes with fludrocortisone and midodrine. Our experience with it is that it does help to a certain extent, but you still have to look out for the side effects of medications. So it's an extra pill count. But if the neurological disease, especially or the diabetic autonomopathy is actually very bad, you can't run away from it. So you still have to give that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. The other one is about food where um, people with diabetes and so on. So because in Singapore, it's very hard to sort of um, convince seniors not to wear sandals, lah, you know, it's so uncomfortable. So like um, what would be um, like somebody is asking, um, is it a suitable? Oh, I lost Wai Chong. Wai Chong, I lost you. Question stop. Yay, we can all go now. Coffee time. <laughs> hear me? No, I can't no. hear you. Okay, come back. You're come frozen. Back. Okay. okay. Anyway, now you can hear me. Okay, yes. the question, Um, I'll just read out one sample of it, but there are two. Like, uh, what type of footwear is suitable for DM and frequently swollen feet patients? Would sandals be a suitable choice Um, where they can release the strap loser when the uh, when the feet is swollen? Or there is cover footwear the Rec um the only recommendation. What about people who who don't have hygiene awareness? Cover who wear tend to be very smelly for them, you know. So maybe can you talk a little bit about food wear? Okay, uh I mean for me it's the practical aspects like and whether really the person got a carer or not. So I will tell you that the extreme will be uh the podiatrists actually do have uh diabetic specific footwear that they actually, I wouldn't say market. Lah. No, in the hospital, uh -huh. they actually have this kind of footwear that they actually uh, tell them where to buy and 
these things are actually kind of like uh, uh, bespoke to you know for the patient in terms of size and so on and so forth. So it's very broad. There's Velcro on it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's actually, in my opinion, uh, very expensive. Like, you know, it's like one or $200 per pair or something like that, which Auntie Ao is quite cheapskate about. Now, if you really want to wear sandals with uh, uh, in a diabetic foot, maybe you can consider a pair of socks. Only because truly what you want to prevent is sand and grit, okay, from getting onto the toes or the neuropathic foot and then you step on that without knowing. Wearing socks are the only other thing. The next thing that always happens with socks is you do not wear socks without shoes in the older person in our local setting. Why? They would pow pow sure die one, sure slip and fall. So if you wear a pair of sandals with socks, when you sit down to take off your sandals, you should be taking out the socks as well. Otherwise, you're walking around with socks, you are going to be asking for a lot of trouble. So the, the compromise, in my opinion, is a pair of good sandals, well strapped, certainly, but I would suggest wear a pair of socks so that at least the dust and the dirt does not come in. For any podiatrist who's attending this talk, if you do disagree, please let us know because Auntie Ao uh, always is too practical. Podiatrists say I'm very cheap skin. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question about assessment tool in a nursing home. What kind of uh, forest assessment tool would you recommend for people working in a nursing home? Can I just be very honest? Anybody who is institutionalized is forest high until proven otherwise. Hmm. So, so I, I, I would say that, you know, if we say that the person has low risk and the person falls, I mean, so, I mean, as long as we understand that the risk is also taken uh, with the family, uh, we have discussed that before, the patient has cognition. So actually, uh, I would say that if you ask me, if the person is slightly cognitively impaired already, I would say the forest is higher. You know, whether the person is Anna Schwarzenegger is a secondary issue. The second mm -hmm. thing is, you no, know, I remember the pictures that I showed you. Uh, a person who is thin, who has got very little muscle mass, even if you're, you think that the assessment was like low risk, the overall picture tells you that the person's muscle mass is not probably able to sustain them when they actually have a, a, a balance issue, right? So none of us are really experts in looking at balance and gait. So these are the things that you might actually have problems. Huh? So your red flags really will be previous uh, uh, fall risk or previous fallers before. I tell you, I use that as my first starting platform. You have mm. a lot of assessment tools, no matter how you assess them. Number one is if you actually read the papers, anybody who's institutionalized is already at high risk because mm. they are not even having common activities like you and I taking bus, taking, yeah. uh, running after the bus and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. There's a question about calorie intake. You mentioned about 33 to 34 calories per kg per day. Um, is that for a person with a normal IDL, ADL lifestyle? What about a person who is bed bound? How do you calculate? You you see, be uh bed bound people still you need about thirty cal calories for basal metabolic rate. Ah, okay. So thirty is really you are trying to keep them alive, law. But if yeah. you are like half dead, half sick with a fracture or a severe infection, I'm really trying sometimes to hit fifty calories per kilogram body weight in the hospital setting to give them a fighting chance, so to speak. Ah, okay. Okay, there are a lot of questions related to osteoporosis. I think it's quite exciting like, for a lot of people. So, uh, <laughs> so there are questions like, um, you know, uh, stopping at this phosphonate, you know, like uh, after five years, do you stop? When do you stop? And also, like a person's on um, SSRI causing osteoporosis, do you change a different class of antidepressant? And uh, should you... Um, uh, stop the um, dinosumet because the person had frequent UTI and if you stop dinosumet, do you replace it with something else like alendronate? Alendron and uh, for, for VMD measurement, for people who are hemiplegic, do you, how do you make sure that the hemi you measure on the right side? Is there a difference between both sides for people who are hemiplegic? Yeah. Okay, stop, 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 stop. okay so let's go back. Uh, hemiplegia, for sure, you try to take the normal side. Okay, mm. so, you know, I hope the radiographer is sing mok la. I tell you, there's one uh, very unsing mok radiographer. Uh, both sides actually had uh, uh, a replacement of the hip. They still reported it. I feel like piaking them, you know, the radio. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, with a metallic thing there, how would not the BNB be great, right? So, so that's <laughs> one. The second thing is, when do we stop it? So, I think we did have one slide about when we stop this force. Uh, if the BMD has actually come back to almost normal, Okay, and the patient is low risk. If the patient is high risk, you will do up to 10 years and then consider transiting. Uh, but if you are transiting, uh, it's actually, okay, to be very honest with you, I'm very honest. Uh, most of my patients don't last 10 years. Uh, 
All right. So they they usually will have gone went to their maker. Okay, before that. So those people who are on medications, if you become bed bound, they can't sit up right and all that. The oral ones are out of the question. Mm. Uh, then the injections are even more out of the questions because how the heck are you going to get them there unless you're going to give them uh, at home, right? So uh, when do you then start uh, continue the denosumab? All right, you can still continue indefinitely, but it's really truly expensive. If you want to translate to oral bis force. The reason why most people start on injection is not just about convenience. There's certain reasons why you actually continue uh, uh, denosumab is because number one, uh, it's six monthly, it's easy to administer, there's convenience. Number two, the creatinine clearance is falling. So if the CCT is up to maybe 19, you can still give the denosumab. Number three is, uh, you know, if the patient is not having recurrent UTI. So all those people with recurrent UTI, I actually don't start because I don't want to be the cause of the next one. Mm. Okay, I think that's all very, very helpful. You've answered almost all the questions, but the rest of the questions are related. So I think we don't really need to address and we are overrunning and um, uh, oh, there's a question about hypocalcemia. So if a person is on alendron and dinosumab, must we measure calcium regularly? I mean, if you have, uh, you're confident that the person has been able to sustain it. So for instance, right, if the person truly, truly is a poor calcium diet person and you have supplemented it and your one-time check there's no hypocalcemia and you don't suspect that this person has got some endocrine disease that causes hypocalcemia or even renal disease, right? Because hypo or hypo will be a problematic issue when you actually want to yeah. give anti-resorptives. So uh, 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 if you don't have those kind of scenarios, then I might not actually check it religiously. Oh, okay. Can I just make so a very quick mention on people who are on PPI? Yeah? So yeah. there's this recent thing that I noticed, okay, and it's probably not related very much to osteoporosis, but they did talk about PPI, maybe one of those uh, aggravating factors for osteoporosis. I want to recognize that the more uh, important electrolyte that I have noticed is not hypocalcemia, it's actually hypomagnesemia. But you yeah. and I know that calcium and magnesium are, are actually intermittently linked. Actually, my physio is very bad. Like, you can go and read it, okay? So uh, if the person is on chronic PPI, then you, you would maybe want to check the calcium. Side. If they have been stable, then it's actually a good consideration to start. But if they're actually low, then please check the magnesium and you might have to then transit from a PPI to something else. Yeah, so... PPI does cause low calcium through low Hypo. magnesium. Yeah, yeah. If, 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 if it's bad enough. I okay. just want to address the SSRI. Yeah. Um, if you have a toss between SSRI causing osteoporosis, the link is not very, very strong. And if they can tolerate the two medicines, then why not? Lah? Because you don't want mm. the med a mad, cannot sleep, agitated, depressed woman that then jump off. And then, of course, whatever osteoporosis, never mind, it's called bye-bye. You know? yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks Lydia. Thanks for the very informative talk. Uh, we have overrun by 16 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think with that, uh, I suppose we can close the session. Just a uh, shout out to our subsequent programs. Apart from Wilson Chong's wound, wound, course, uh, wound lecture, we're going to have another two lectures on neuropsychiatry, which should be very interesting. And uh, um, yeah, and also our caregiver conference. Um, and uh, someone, Dr. Raja Gopal, has just mentioned that she's attending for the first time. Welcome. And I hope you can share this too with other of your colleagues to join this webinar. Christina, you have any um, last words to say? No, thank you very much, uh, Lydia. And also to all your audience, please join us for the next webinar and also mark your calendars for 6 October for our caregiver conference at Suntec Convention Centre. Okay, bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Do your exercises. <laughs> Load up on calcium and vitamin D. And sun yourself, but not chocolate. Yeah, wear bikinis. <laughs> oh, okay, gross. Bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>